My name is Giovanni Ciuffo. I direct the Minimal Invasive uh, Bloodless Heart Surgery Center. I am presented to you as a clinic for a tricuspid mitral valve repair, along with a left atrioplasty through a vertical transeptal approach. Our patient in this case is a 78-year-old lady who presented with symptomatic moderate tricuspid regurgitation and severe mitral regurgitation with a flail posterior lupus. She has an enlarged left atrium, but she's still in sinus rhythm. As you can see in the echocardiographic image, the left atrium is uh, significantly large with a globular shape, and uh, you can visualize the P2 segment, which is causing severe mitral regurgitation. Here are some still images of the, uh, Doppler, the um, Doppler images showing a severe mitral regurgitation Z with a wide P cell consistent with a severe mitral regurgitation. There's a large left atrial appendage, which I will obliterate from within the left atrium during the case. A 3D rendition shows you once again the flail segment detail, and uh, you can identify that that portion of the flail segment belongs to P2 callot on the posterior lupa. Incidentally, a small PFO was also identified, which will be taken care of by our vertical transeptal approach. Once the patient had bicaval cannulation and aortic cannulation, we go on pump and we start with the encircling of the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava with this yellow vessel loops, which I like to use because they give me a good sense of how tight I can uh, make my snare in order to uh, obtain a good hemostasis. Same thing is done here on the inferior vena cava. Always a double loop using a C clamp that allows me to have a good curve around the uh, SVC and the IVC. Here I'm cross clamping the ascending aorta and uh, at this point I can inject my retrograde cardioplegia. I tighten my snares and I proceed with a right atriotomy. I like to use a number 11 blade for this part of the operation, and I carefully proceed toward the posterior abscess of the right atrium to identify the strong end scapula. You can see the yellow line there. I normally leave it in place because it doesn't really obstruct my view and makes it easy for the anesthesiologist to have the strong ends already in place at the end of the operation. If patient is planning to do a tricuspid valve repair, Traction stitches are placed to open the right atrium, and now you see me perform a um, feature annuloplasty repair. I use a K technique, uh, most of the times with a pledgel stitch in furrow crawling, which pinches off the commissure between the anterior and posterior lupus. Most of the time, one single pledgel stitch, if it's adequately placed, is enough to uh, give you a very good repair. I've done over 300 repairs this way, and my follow-up studies are showing an excellent uh, result in terms of permanent repair and competence of a tricuspid valve. I think it's extremely important to make sure that the right amount of uh, commissure is pinched off. In very large tricuspid annuli, sometimes I also pinch off the commissure between the septal leaflet and the inferior leaflet. Most of the times you can have a good visual appreciation of how the tricuspid valve leaflets come together after this repair is very well done. Once the tricuspid valve has been repaired, I can proceed with a transeptal incision. Uh, make sure to use just the tip of the number 11 blade because you don't want to create lacerations in the back wall of the left atrium, which might be very close to your septum. I start from the limbus, and I just cut through the um, area where the small PFO was so that when we close the transeptal incision at the end of the case, we'll get rid of the uh, patent parameter band. With a large left atrium and this type of incision, your exposure of the mitral valve tends to be excellent. Uh, next step will be to assess the mitral valve. First, I'm looking at the flail segment and the 
P2 scallop, you can see the small core that then didn't feel attached to that scallop, and then I proceed with assessment of the anterior lift back. With a nerve hook, I'm isolating each chordal attachment between the anterior lift leg and the uh, ventricle to make sure that there is no portion of the anterior lift leg that collapses above the coaptal plane. In this particular case, the anterior lift leg is still fairly flexible, even though you can see there's a small area of calcification between the mitral and the posterior anterior lift leg. We'll proceed with a resection, a small quadrangular resection, almost a wedge resection of P2 scallop, uh, sparing any other chordal attachment from P3 and P2 scallop, which will be then um, useful in keeping the posterior lift leg at the proper level of coaptation. Once this is removed, we have to reconstruct a gap, the gap between the P1 and P3 scallop. I like to use figure of eight stitches, and I try to place them in a way that allows me to invert the cut edges of P1 and P3 so that they stay on the ventricular side of the anterior lift leg. I believe this will give you a smoother apposition plane on between the anterior lift leg and the posterior lift leg. If it's a very flimsy lift leg, um, I use spiral crawling, or otherwise, like in this case, it's thick enough for me to use a uh, coral crawling. Here again, I'm showing you the area of calcification I mentioned before on the anterior lift leg. I, I evaluate that and I'm identifying the trigone trigonal area, which is a very important stitch, and you have to learn to recognize where the trigone is, because otherwise you might get the stitch that goes either through the atrial wall or through the lift leg, and you miss the fibrotic, mechanically resistant portion of the trigone. Once I place the stitches, most of the times I tug on the stitch a little, and I get that sense that it's, as you can see here, really resistance to traction. At this point, we can size the anterior lift leg. Seems to be suitable for a size 28 amyloplasty band, which I will select for this much of our detail. Next step, once I ask my nurses to get a size 28 amyloplasty band, is to place stitches along the posterior annulus from trigone to trigone, and again, Careful attention is always paid to pass the stitches right at the fibrotic portion of the annulus. If you're a little more external, you obviously might be getting only atrial wall, which doesn't have a good mechanical quality. If you are too internal, you're going to be on the anterior lift leg, on the posterior lift leg. Once the stitches are in place, you will reassess if they are properly lined up and then it's time to place stitches through the annuloplasty band. I tend to say sometimes by always asking my scrap nurse to have both needles always loaded so that I can very quickly proceed with passing all the needles in, uh, in the equivalent segment of the annuloplasty band. The annuloplasty band is placed in, in position and um, I then cut the holder and I then slide the annuloplasty band close to the posterior annulus to make sure we have a good lineup. We can then proceed with uh, tying the stitches in place to secure the annuloplasty band, and we then remove the excess tissue material to proceed with our moment of truth. I use a wet rubber catheter with a bulb syringe and I inject saline solution in the ventricle under pressure to see if the mitral valve can actually hold the pressure and have still no leak. As you can see, the valve here is perfectly competent and if I push on the anterior lift leg, you can see how the saline will squirt out of the ventricle under pressure. This finding will make you pretty comfortable that your repair is going to be of good quality.
Max had to see with the left tape to obtain its closure by doing two running pixel lines at the edges of the orifice of left tape to appendage using most of the time photo probe. Once the left tape to appendage is closed, in this particular case I'm focusing on this big fold that you can see on the posterior wall of the left tape here. And that's the area I'm going to use to create, to perform a left apioplasty. You can see the stitches are going in and out of the actual wall on the two sides of this large fold, so that when I tie them in a running fashion, it will evert the entire fold of left apium and leave just a smooth suture line on the apial side. By using this technique, most of the times you can eliminate at least three to four centimeters of the uh, left apial circumference, which will be sufficient to reduce this uh, left apial volume to a normal size. And the echocardiographic images at the end of the surgery will show you the before and after in terms of apioplasty and volume reduction for the left apium. Here you can see the completed suture line tied in place. And once this portion of the operation is completed, we can proceed with closure of the transept of the sigma. The, uh, that portion where you see me place the needle now on the uh, transept of the sigma tends to be sometimes pretty thick. It's help helpful to use a size SH needle with, pho with photocrawling for this closure. Same type of suture material, or same size needle is used to close the right apiotomy. And as you can see me do here, I proceed now with a second la layer, second suture line going in between the bites of the first suture line. Just as a reminder, here is the um, echocardiographic images before the surgery with a large left apium on this P2 segment. And here is the after with a post-op echo. No more micro regurgitation. As you notice, the left apium now is a perfectly normal size. I welcome any questions or comments from you and uh, from patients and colleagues. And you can write at any time at my email address, p2for at aol.com. Thank you for your uh, kind attention.